and that's us on. Okay. And today's guest, we've got Tommy Campbell. First of all, Tom, I just want to say thanks for letting us into your house and coming on the show. A wee bit of background about you. Um, you were only convicted of one of the biggest cases probably in the UK from the Doyle, the Doyle Ice Cream Wars, where six family members were murdered and you were probably involved in one of the biggest miscarriages of justice that the UK's ever seen. Mm. So, like I say, it's good for you to tell your story and get it out there, but yeah. we'll just go right back to the start and whereabouts, where you grew up and stuff. Okay, yeah. I, I was born in Glasgow, uh, Milton Street, Glasgow. Uh, that's the Cow Cadence. Uh, went from there to George Street, Glasgow. From George Street to Canteen. Really Canteen, I would say. Brought to Canteen because Canteen's the most of memories. More than anything, George Street is more the old tenements. The, the, the spiral staircases and the outside toilets and things like that. And the rats, of course. Rats the scallop fever, water and stuff like that. Uh, uh, memories of those days are just like... Yeah, yeah, it's like pre-war, you know. <laughs> Although it was well after the war, but it seemed like everybody mm -hmm. still had army stuff on, everybody still had helmets, and everybody still wore army jackets and army belts and things, army boots and things. There was still an issue, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. But canteen, I would say canteen was uh, the, the place where... A lot of memories there. Yeah. Because you were youngest of 10. Yeah, I was young as 10, two died young, of course, so Sorry eight years were brought up together, uh, and I was the youngest. Well, it's, it's, it's like very, very much like being a boy named Sue mm -hmm. when you're the youngest, <laughs> uh, because it's, uh, my ma, my mother used to call me Tommy, take your blame, because when anything ever goes wrong, it's always one will blame the other, and that one will blame the next one down, and that one will blame the next one down, and there's only... There's only one at the bottom, and that's Tommy, take the blame. The youngest? Yeah, so my ma used to say that. Oh, it's Tommy, take the blame again. Mm -hmm. you know, so, obviously, Cantines are, was a bit of a rough area, probably, all the schemes in Glasgow were. Yeah. So, when did you start getting involved in, like, with the younger boys and causing think, a bit of havoc? Uh, I think a lot of it's got to do with poverty. I think a lot of it's got to do with uh, fitting in. If you can't... Uh, if you can't get the latest casuals, you can't get the latest trousers, the latest jackets, you can't do, you can't keep up, you've not got it. And nobody, and there's people round about you, a lot of you just haven't got it. You can't do these kind of things. But at least together, I, as a group, you kind of form like a kind of family, don't you? You kind of become a group, you kind of, kind of you knit, kind of knit together and become become the one the one unit a gang yeah it forms a gang didn't oh. it yeah i never liked the word gangster i never liked to be called uh, mm. a gangster when people call me a gangster i say i don't even like i don't like gangsters i don't, I don't, I... I don't even like the way gangsters think mm -hmm. yeah so i don't know what I don't know where I would fit in. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, maybe, maybe I was a street fighter. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's what I'm saying. You come under anybody that's involved, anybody that's been in prison or anything, you're going to get that bracket of gangster. Yeah. It's just, yeah. that's the label that comes with the territory, yeah. isn't it? When, what age did you get your first sentence, Tommy? I get sentenced to 10 years in the Young Offenders Institution when I was... I think I've just turned 19 at the time. Uh, I think the charge was you, Thomas Campbell, did form part of a writer's mob of evilly disposed persons which acted of a common purpose to conduct itself in a violent, riotous and tumultuous manner to the great terror and alarm of Her Majesty's lieges. Ten years in prison. It was part of uh, what they call art and part. So... Each person is guilty of all the acts of every other. So it doesn't matter what crime is committed by the group over a period of time. When you're convicted of that charge, you're convicted of all those crimes that all the group committed. Uh, 
So it was a whole series. Within the Mobbing Right chart itself was a whole series. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, like, like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, 10 years. That's a long time for a 19-year-old. Oh, it was crushing. It was so destroying. It was difficult, difficult, difficult. But, but, uh, it forced, it forced the... Uh, Force you to, 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 to look within yourself and to grow up, to grow out of it, if you know what I mean. To look beyond the street, to see that there is something else beyond the street, to look. I educated myself. I, I didn't want to just waste that time, you know. I, I looked for, 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 for good books, uh, good books in philosophy and philosophy. Uh, followed different religions, checked them out, things like that. Just to try and educate yourself. And science, it. science as well. Uh, rather than fill my head full of uh, fiction and nonsense. Bullshit. Yeah. A lot of people, like I say, a lot of people who go to the jail end up addicted to drugs because they can't yeah. handle their sentence. So it's easy to numb that pain get herself full of drugs and they kind of think it'll make their sentence go faster where they kind of bottle the pain up. I've seen it. I've seen it within prisons. <laughs> All the prisons are the same. It's as if they turned them into drug addict factories. I, I, I used to call a prison, a shorts prison, for example, the hate factory. The hate factories of hell. That's what they turned the prisons into. They turned them into hate factories. And the they have an incident in the prison. You have a, 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 a small uprising, say a small uprising, for example, and half the prison staff are on sick leave because of their nerves. You know? They, they take nerve, take leave because of their nerves are off for weeks. Some of them never come back because of a small incident that occurred. But the prisoners live there. They live there every day. And these incidents are happening all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's people being stabbed, and that's not even considered as a major incident. People being slashed is not considered as a major incident. Yeah. It's... The, the, the guys turn to drugs. I mean, even people have never touched heroin before. They'll try it just to get just to ease the, 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 the stress. Misery, the misery. Yeah, and the misery, just to get mm -hmm. to be somewhere other than in hell for a moment, you know what I mean? Uh, and then they'll try it again, and then they liked it, and they'll try it again. They're turning out drug addicts. The prison is a drug addict fa factory. Guinea pigs. Yeah, they're turning out drug addicts. Uh, they hate factories, and they're turning out drug addicts. Yeah. Well, like I say, the, the rate, the percentage rate of people actually coming out of the prison and changing their life is very, very slim. Very yeah. slim. You either meet more people that's going to attract more crime, violence, yeah. robberies, whatever, because you're surrounded by people who a life mm. of crime is all you know. My life was changed before I went in. So so I didn't need to change. I, 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 I was one of the worst, as far as they were concerned, the worst offenders for being a nuisance within the prison. Only because I was already reformed, you know what I mean? I wouldn't take the nonsense, I wouldn't take, I couldn't, my mind, my soul, my spirit couldn't, couldn't take the reconditioning back to, 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 to being that zombie, that, that prisoner zombie. Uh, people would say things like, how can you get off with that? How can you do that? If a prison of, a gang of prison officers come up to me and say, right, okay, strip, sir, strip. And I say, no, thanks. And he goes, he goes, mm, mm, okay. And then he'll just walk away. And other prisoners see this and they go, how, 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 how did you do that? How can you get away with that? Nobody else can get away with that. If they say strip, you better strip. And if you don't strip, they'll just muff to you, tie your knots, rip the gear off of you, strangle you, 
put your arms up your back, twist your legs up your back, rip the clays off of you, stick your fingers up your ass, and throw you in the digger, right, for refusing to be an order. Because the order is strip, and you better strip, you do better it. pirouette, bend do down, do pat told. your ass, and do what you're told. Did they fear you in the jail? Your first sentence, were you feared? I, I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. I, who, I don't know why anybody the repu- would. You had the reputation, but did you know that? Yeah, I, ha- I have a reputation as being tough, a, a, a big propensity for violence. Yeah, there was a time in my life where, where, where I could have told the face of you for for saying the wrong thing. Uh, but that was a long time prior, a long time previous. Mm. To, to, to me being back in the jail and but of course I've still got that history so therefore people are aware of it it sticks yeah of course Much it sticks, sticks. Doesn't it? so if they're yeah. saying that it's hard I for don't people... think you ever lose that, that yeah. potential mm-hmm. yeah were you angry as a way were you angry as a teenager when did you start well, I've, been, become... I've been stabbed a lot of times <clears throat> I've been stabbed I've been critically ill I've been I've been uh, I've been attacked with axes and uh, meat cleavers and machetes I, I've been put put to the ground and chopped to pieces, and on more than one occasion, uh, I've been left gutted. I've been left tripping over my own guts in the street, uh, and I don't know if, uh, as a young man at sixteen or seventeen, if don't know if that causes post traumatic stress disorder uh-huh. that people don't know you're suffering. Because I, I so therefore, when somebody uh-huh. pulls you out a knife, mm-hmm. I'm going to go. Berserk. It's just to get that because they're no, they're side. not going to get doing that to me again. Mm-hmm. I know how it feels. I've suffered. I've I've been in hospital. I've had, I've I've had the priest saying the last rites over me, and, and and felt myself being pulled from the darkness to this chant, this sound, this somebody's chanting something, and 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 following the chant through the darkness, and opening my eyes and finding a priest standing there. Giving me the last rights. So, do you think that's that fight or flight where you either sit back or else you just go fuck it and have that switch? Yeah, you decide fight I'm, or flight. I'm not what, what am I going to do? Am I going to kill her for the rest of my life? Mm-hmm. And you know what I mean? I'm only a boy. I, 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 and and I, I said to the priest, I'm a fucking proddy. I never <laughs> said it like that. I never said it like that. But but that was, I, I, I've grown to it, I've, I've grown it because I could hardly speak, mm-hmm. like, like, but I've grown it. And what he did was, he reached there and he put his hand on my head and said, God bless you, my son, right? How can you be angry with somebody like that? How can you say that that person is not a good person, right? I, I was telling him, to, to me, I thought he was chanting me into, into death. Did you hear him? I could hear, I could hear him in the distance, and it felt to me that that that, that noise that he was making, that sound, that chant, was chanting me into death, and I was resisting it, and I fought it, and, and I fought my way to the surface. And when I opened my eyes, it was a priest, and I said to him, "I'm a fucking prodigy, mm-hmm. right?" <laughs> and, and he and he just blessed me. He said, "God bless you, my son." He was just happy that I, that I opened my eyes and I spoke and that I was alive. He was just happy to see me alive. He was a good person, you know what I mean. Uh, uh, but 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 then there, therefore, therefore, I know the pain. Every breath is agony. Adolf Hitler doesn't doesn't deserve that pain. Uh, your worst enemy doesn't deserve to suffer what I suffered. Every breath. Uh, 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 and then people saying laughing's the best medicine. People come up and tell you jokes, and you dare not laugh. If you laugh, you're going to split wide open. Mm-hmm. Your whole body's going to split wide open like a split melon. Don't dare make me laugh. You know so, Jake, that's what just, there was a catalyst, the trigger point to go, yeah. you know what? So, just... Yeah, so if somebody pulls out a knife to me after that, that situation, mm-hmm. you can imagine my reaction. I'm not going through that again. That person's going to get butchered. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and Glasgow is like that. People are pulling out knives all the time. You know what I mean? You couldn't go from A to B. You couldn't go into the city centre. You couldn't go from one housing scheme to another housing scheme. You couldn't cut through one housing scheme to get to the the main shopping centre without going through somebody else's territory and without them coming at you with knives, axes, swords, you know. I couldn't go to the bus stop 
I couldn't go to the bus stop without passing through enemy territory and they're coming after me with axes. Do you think so you live a wee bit in fear as well, constantly looking all your shoulder and when you're involved in like gangs and stuff, you're, you're, you're always wary, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, you've got to be paranoid. If you're oh. not paranoid, you'll not survive. Paranoid is a survival factor in a jungle. And if you're not paranoid, you won't survive. You, you, you'll go down. Uh, paranoia heightens your senses, it heightens your sight, it heightens your, your hearing. It heightens your sense of smell, it heightens your reactions, it heightens your reflexes. Everything is super toned. Uh -huh. uh, it's super toned up, right? Uh, uh, so when somebody takes a swipe at me with something, then my reflex has blocked him. And I've took a swipe at him before he, b before he's blinked. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. uh, so after, see, after your, your 10 year sentence, Tommy, what, how was your life then when you came out with your... Worse, or were you more calm? Let's say you educated was, yourself with the books, and yeah, I was. Are you on a vendetta? Or you just couldn't get a fuck. Different. I was different. I was much more calmer, much more into my head, much more into poetry. Uh, people would, uh, people would remark about. I could just start waxing lyrical. We had parties, people drinking, and, and, and somebody would be singing. Uh, orange songs, some of you singing rebel songs and they're going to fight. And I would start reciting poetry, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. uh, my own, my own poetry, uh, 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 some stupid romantic song or something, no. Uh, to stop it, because I could see it coming, I could, uh, you know, and I could re-divert it, because I could use my head and re-divert things. So that's when you're getting angry? used to read a bit of poetry or say it, you're meant to try and channel the, the anger away. When I, was, when, when I was in the prison doing that 10 year sentence, poetry was my escape. Poetry got me out of the, 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 the frustrations and, and deep depressions that prison brings upon you. Deep, deep depressions. Uh, uh, poetry is escape. I would meditate. Uh, and, and 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 come out of it and and just write a poem. Sometimes just straight out, just write them straight out. Sometimes work on. Did anybody put you onto yoga or meditation or reading no, books, just reading. or did you just do it, find it for yourself? I found it reading. I would study Zen, for instance. Uh, Zen, Zen, the art motorcycle maintenance, the way of Zen. Uh, all, all the books on Buddha. Uh, I read Hinduism, and I, I read some books. Like, and then realised that half of it was in Russian. The guy who wrote it, the guy who wrote it was the guy who wrote it was Ru was Russian, and he kept he couldn't he could he couldn't quite get his English right, and he, so therefore when he couldn't get the English word, he was putting a Russian word. And I was wondering how I couldn't. I'm finding, I'm finding this book get hard. Dyslexic. Read. Yeah, I'm saying to myself, I'm not as clever as I thought I was. <laughs> yeah, but but the book was a wee bit harder than mm -hmm. than normal. Would you say you had a tough upbringing? Obviously, with, with eight kids, it must have it been It didn't seem tough at the time. It seemed great at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but looking back in comparison with what other people would call tough, yeah, it was tough. Was your other brothers or that involved in any violence or in jails? Or? Not violence. No, no, no violence. Yeah, maybe a bit of roguery. Yeah. Everybody's got a bit My of roguery. My brother's lucky done 15 years in China. China? Yeah. yeah. It done full 15 years in China. Uh, he's wrote a book. Uh, What's it called? You know, red tape or something. Red tape. Uh, something. Something to do with the wall of China. Who know? was it? Uh, so, did you think you met met people that was involved in crime in the jails? And uh, when you came out, were you and who, who were you hanging about with then? A lot of people from Cantine, East End. Ah, uh, well, I think mostly there was escape trial. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, shortly after the commute was the escape trial with, with the rope trick mm -hmm. and that broke my grow I, 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 I moved to Berlanock uh, and that broke my grow because of the rope trick that brought me into contact with my grow uh, what escape was that Tommy hmm? what escape uh, Johnny Boy Steel the Berlini one yeah Jim Steel mm -hmm. and Archie Steen Berlinian escape, three A category prisoners came over the wall. Yeah, uh, Johnny spoke about that on my show. Right. They went up the up the wall and 
absolute down the wall with the car waiting for them. Yeah, that's right. The, mm-hmm. the, the thing was that nobody could figure out how the rope got up there to begin with. I had already been, I had, I had already been in, in Berlin and I knew how to do it. And it was, it was actually, <laughs> it was actually me that, that told them how it can be done, mm-hmm. if you don't talk. Uh, so anyway, did you ever try and escape yourself any time? No, I, 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 I figured, I figured four ways out of Berlin, and the four of them went into effect. Mm-hmm. Every time successful, and I never took any of them myself. Because <laughs> uh, obviously, when you did your 10 years and whatever you were involved in, obviously the biggest trial of your life came with Ice Cream Wars. But when you go at the chap at the door, to say that you were getting charged with that, mm-hmm. how were you feeling then? <sighs> Angry and angry because I thought it was another drag through polo stations, and uh, I thought I'd be back later on that day. I thought I'd be back back home that day, if when I was arrested, uh, and if not that day, first appearance in court. They just kept going on. First few days of examination, we'll be home, I'll be home a day. I, it's one of the things, I mean, I've been fitted up before, but this is one that you think, nah, the one, the one real one, the one the real person for this, they don't want, they're not going to fit somebody up for this. I, I know how corrupt they are and how, how uh, heartless they are about fitting people up for, for robberies and things like that. Eh, drugs and things, but no date for murder, no murder like this. So I thought they're going to see. I mean, they they had already even said to me, "We know you didn't do it, but first we thought you must be do it. You must have done it. You must be close to it." Eh, but we're investigation and investigation, a month long investigation, is mo- removing you further and further from it. But we can't get over the fact that you must know who did it. And if you don't tell us who did it, it's because you're too close to it to, to say who did it. And that was that was what they were going on. This, this was it. But I didn't. I had never had a clue. You know what I mean? I was totally baffled. I was right on the wrong track. It's because the papers kept going on and on and on about ice cream wars. And from the start, they were talking about the, 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 the brother of Agnes Lafferty and Ice Cream Wars in Gethamok. The brother of Agnes Lafferty just finished a 10 year sentence, a gangster just finished a 10 year sentence, Ice Cream And it was all getting put down to Ice Cream Wars. And I was going, that's totally wrong. Right? So it put me right off of looking at any daily Ice Cream Vans. You know what I'm talking about? If it wasn't focusing around me right from the start, right? I might have seen, I might have seen, you know what I mean? I might have seen who did it, I might have seen the culprit, but I couldn't, I was totally blindsided by by the whole thing at the start. Because it's not just, like I say, it's a mass murder, it's six family members. Yeah. This is, like I say, one of the biggest miscarriages of justice in the UK because it's massive to eventually yeah. to, to spend that much time behind yeah. bars and then eventually get a not guilty yeah. after it. But obviously at the start, yeah, when you got charged, what was the evidence against you? The evidence was two verbals. At the end of the day, it was William Love saying that he overheard the conversation in a pub, that he was present in a pub, uh, and, and, and through the, the, that, that evening in the pub, he overheard, I think he overheard me saying something about setting fire to fat boys door to give him a fright. And the and and everybody around the table going aye 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 aye, and that was a key witness. Yeah. Just one verbal. Yeah, was there nobody seen at the, the no. start of the fire? There's no evidence. The judge, DNA. Yeah, I can quote the judge on that. There's no evidence to say that these men were near that scene of the crime at the time the crime was committed, and so therefore the evidence is that of inference from the evidence which is before you, which is that of the evidence of the witness love. 
Right. Which he eventually did change his statement. Yeah, which he eventually said, no, I, the, the conversation never took place. The Polish put me up to it. The Polish put me up to saying that as part of a deal to get me off with my own charges of armed robbery and attempted murder. You know. Uh, How many people charged you about it? Turned out, it turned out that he had already given an alibi for the weekend that he said the conversation. See, he'd, he'd been charged with armed robbery, right? And he gave an alibi for that armed robbery. The alibi covered the weekend that he testified in court in my trial that he heard the conversation in the pub. According to his alibi, he had stayed with his, I think he stayed with his sister that weekend or something, and he'd never left the house, right? At my trial, now, now the Procurator of Fiscal and the Crown were aware of that alibi and the times of that alibi. Yet at my trial, he contradicted that and said he was in a pub and overheard a conversation. Now, the Crown were aware of, of, of that contradiction, but never told the, the, the defence. You, you understand? Holding back evidence? Yeah, yeah. Which what, what, could have cleared you? Yeah. Uh, uh, exculpatory evidence, mm -hmm. which which is relevant to the defence and what was not made, made available to Because I know we were speaking on the phone, obviously, you were speaking about Mrs Doyle because you could still hear her, the screams yeah. and the pain, obviously, yeah. losing six loved I'm, ones. That must have affected your mindset because it, knowing that you're innocent and going through that, you must have thought, I'm going to get away with this. But then as the trial goes on, was, was there a time you realised, oh, fuck, man, I'm going to get charged here, I'm going to get done? Getting charged was horrifying. Uh, getting taken to court was horrifying. Uh, getting indictment was horrifying. Everything, everything, it's, it's like daggers being put into you. It's like your soul being torn out of you. Being accused of it. The, the, the inference that you might be capable of this is enough. To, 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 to cause you pain, to cause you horror. Eh? You're sitting there, you're not allowed to grieve. You can imagine, you can imagine a situation if you're charged with murdering your wife, right? And you're put into Berlin, right? And your wife is getting the funeral. But you're not allowed to go because you're the accused. But you're not allowed to go. Let's say you're innocent, right? And then, after the funeral, the procurator fiscal says, all right, enough, we've got somebody else for that murder, you can go home now, right? But the funeral's over, and your children are there, maybe your two daughters or something, your children are there, and, and they're looking at you, why did you get accused of killing my mum? Are you a bad person? You know what I mean? And maybe they never got somebody else, maybe the pro procurator fiscal just says, you have not enough evidence where you go home. You know what I mean? But you weren't allowed to grieve. You weren't allowed to go to the funeral. And your children are still looking at you as if they're not sure about you. You know what I mean? You, you can be totally innocent. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Now, now, sitting in that court, I'm an accused person. I'm, I'm the villain. Right? Right? But it was like a spear through my heart to listen to Mrs Doyle. Right? To listen to her, to listen to her give her evidence uh, 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 and to hear her, her cry, right? Uh, it nearly killed me, it nearly broke my heart just to hear her voice, right? Now, I'm the villain in the dock, right? What did it date the jury, right? If I'm the hard hearted bad bastard in the dock and it's done that to me, Right? What has it done to the jury? Actually, I'm not that bad a bastard. <laughs> but what, what I'm saying I know what is, you mean, no. I know what you mean. Yeah, but what, what I'm saying is, there's no way anybody's getting found not guilty of that. All it took was an inference. If he was in a pub when that, that, that was spoke about, he's going to jail for it. And it turns out he admits the conversation never happened at all. How long did it take for him to admit it? How long were you into your sentence? It took about 10 years or something, nine, eight, maybe 10 years or something. But it didn't matter because the court wouldn't, the, the court wouldn't hear it. The second state wouldn't refer us back to court. Why is that? Well, the world was saying what a, a, a witness's change of evidence is not good enough. You need extra proof. To back up that evidence, well, well, wait a minute, his sister. His sister can prove his admission to perjury because his sister saw him shooting the ice cream van 
and gave the police a statement at the time that she saw her brother shoot in the ice cream van. He testified at my trial that Tam Gray shot the ice cream van. Did you have an alibi? Were you? I had an alibi. Yeah, my alibi was in Rome. Yeah. There was no evidence to say that, that any any ads were near or at the scene of the crime. So it was just the evidence of one person? One. I thought, but how can one person as well be enough to incriminate Paul verbal. you? Paul was verbal. The police, when they arrested me, said that I said, uh, the fire fat boy, no. I only wanted the Van Windy show up. The fire at Fat Boys was only meant to be a fight that went too far. So that's two verbals. So one verbal for Billy Love, overheard oh, a conversation in a pub. One verbal for the police, the fire was a fright that went too far. That's enough to charge Two it. verbals. Mm -hmm. Two verbals corroborate each other, and that's enough to send you to prison for, for life. 20 years. Life in 20 years. Uh, did you have any grievances or anything with the Doyle family? Did you have no, any? No. Did you know them? No, no, not at all. Uh, no grievance whatsoever. Uh, obviously, when you go to prison, you go to life sentence. Was there a, obviously, I know you fought as hard as you could to get out, which you eventually did, but 20 years to take a man's life is. is I, I couldn't think of anything worse, if I'm honest. But when when did you start your fight to go, fuck this, I'm no bending or here and letting them win? Anybody I, went for a conviction of me, I need to fight for my life back. I, I had I had done a ten year sentence and when I had got out of that ten year sentence I realised I was suffering from culture shock. I was conditioned as a prisoner. Right? I was conditioned as a prisoner and I couldn't cope with society after the ten year sentence, right? Now it took me a lot of time and a lot of self training. Uh, 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 to, to recondition myself back to normal again. I, I never get trained for freedom or not, nothing. I've done the 10 years. Ah, right? so you've done the 10 years, you never yeah. got any I never weekends, nothing, nothing, I never to, got nothing. I never to get got back weekend. into society. I never got a weekend leave, I never get anything, right? And it took me a long time to recondition myself back into normality, the normality of society, right? And when I went back to prison for the 20 years, I wouldn't allow them to recondition me out of that normality. So when a prison officer says to me, strip, bend over, pirouette, bend over, pat your buttocks, I go and take a fuck for yourself. <laughs> aye. Yeah. Yeah, so, there's nothing aye. normal about it. So the 10 years you've re-educated yourself and, and realised I'm not going to be a fucking guinea pig in here. Yeah. I'm going yeah. to stone up for what there's I believe nothing in. normal about it. Prisoners, prisoners, it happens because it's the usual. Prison officers do it to them every day. It becomes the usual, disregardless of however abnormal it is. Do you think that's to embarrass you and dishearten you and just yeah, to break to, your soul? Yeah, yeah, it's to bring you down. Uh, 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 I try to destroy your, your dignity, you know. No, no, no. When they when they come to me, team handy to, and, and batter me and rip the gear off me, tie me in knots and tear the gear off me. I might be in hunger strike, I might be doing to like nine stone or something like that before they're game enough to do it. And they'll rip the gear off me and leave me leave me lying naked as a heap of bones. But I still no strip me of my dignity. They told me to take a clay off under their order and I've refused. They had to do it. They can you know they can strip me of my clothes, but they'll strip me of my dignity. You know what I mean? So at the end of the day, I was only me. I was standing up for my right as a free man and maintaining my dignity, if you don't talk. Mm -hmm. When did you start your first hunger strike, Tommy? Uh, to begin with, it was in Peterhead. To begin with, it was hunger strikes. I would do like 30 days, so that would be like 80... Eight six or something so like that. Two years after your first the, the big sentence, the life yeah. sentence. Yeah. And eight six. After after the after they murdered me. After they murdered me, they kicked me to death. Uh, so I saw the police the, the screws for the jail. Yeah, for Peter Head, yeah. Uh, they stamped all over me, they came into my cell and beat me up and stamped all over me. Uh, I was 
and left me for 18 hours with peritonitis, stomach. Uh, they punctured my, my guts off my spine. I just fractured my spine in two places. Bust my gut, uh, caused peritonitis. It left me for something like 17 hours. And by the time I reached the hospital, I was dead in arrival. Uh, and the evidence was talking about a nurse let out a scream when I start, my body started convulsing again. Uh, you've had some trauma, and we'll speak about that in a minute with you uh, later on, because you've, you've got PTSD, which we, we yeah. speak about. And obviously, the effects of that is enough to give anybody trauma. Like the prison beatings, like yeah. I say, you've, you've even said to me, listen, you're the angel, but to get a life sentence or to get the beatings off the the screws in the jail why were they doing that to you were you causing trouble were you just doing it for again to break no, you just, just just not conforming not conforming with by their rules and regulations yeah yeah conform to the rules of society, well, civil disobedience without being the uh, without being violent or without being aggressive just being civilly civil disobedience eh uh, eh uh, Likes it when, when 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 the appeal fails, come back, refuse to change into prison uniform, refuse to eat prison food, refuse to take prison wages, refuse refuse to work in prison workshops, refuse to work as a, a prison and a prison slave workshops, uh, and quite rightly so because you're there for yeah. You're, you're there for me, yeah. you're there because... Yeah. I'll work on my case, I'll work on le legal, I'll study, I'll study law, uh, I'll, I'll be writing petitions to the Secretary of State, I'll be writing to lawyers, I'll be writing to MPs, I'll be busy. Was it three people go to jail, two, you and, was it Joe? Joe Steele. And somebody got done with conspiracy? Tam, big Tam Gray got 14 years for the shooting, that, that Bullock, William Love eventually admitted that he'd done himself. So that guy got done for a shooting that it wasn't he even him. 14 years for nothing. This was a guy... Big Tam. Who was... I had a guy... So it was a, yeah. allegedly the yeah. the key witness that done the shooting. Yeah, yeah. He eventually admits doing the shooting. Yeah. That's unbelievable, though. Uh, well, 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 the, the way the polls operated at the time, uh, uh, if, if, you can, if you can conform to what they want, if you can say that you had a conversation and that put somebody in the shit, then they'll drop this charge, you'll get your bail that you were refused at the High Court. And that's what happened to him. He got he's already been refused bail at the High Court as a menace to society, by the way. <laughs> Three previous convictions for perverted <coughs> court of justice and then he perverts the court. They asked him to do it again for a fourth time. Uh, and he'll be rewarded for it. He'll get released in bail, get his charges dropped, etc. Just prevent the cause of justice again, Mr. Love. We know you're good at it. You've done it before. You know what I mean? Uh, so they picked the right one, you know. Uh, when I know You've wrote two books. Did you write your first book? When did you write your first book? When I was in prison. Uh, just before I, before I got out in bail. Just before I got out in bail. That would be... Uh, uh, indictment, uh, trial by fire, mm. trial by fire. And what was that book about? A witch hunt, mm -hmm. <laughs> trial by fire. That it was a witch hunt. Uh, the trial was a farce of Freudian proportions. And that's the way I, the, the way I started, because it was a farce of Freudian proportions. Uh, it just tells the story. It goes from charge to charge, just outlining the charge and outlining the evidence and outlining the defence. Charge by charge, taking people through to show how much of a farce it was. Uh, but of course, I'm too deeply involved in it. I'm too deeply in, in, embedded in it. Uh, so when it comes to the appeals and things, I'm too emotionally tied up in it. Uh, so I get too involved in it. And so it's therefore, I don't think it becomes as good, good reading. Because Cause you're writing it though, yeah. Because I'm too close to it and I'm no seeing it impartially, mm -hmm. uh, so it would take it would take somebody more impartial to say you don't need to say that again for the tenth time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, so you spent how long was it? You spent was it ten, eleven years, and then they let you out for a year? 
Is that yeah. correct? That's right, yeah. How were you for the year? See, when they let you out for the year, why did they let you out then? Well, they, they let us out because... Uh, they let us out because William Love had confessed. The, mm -hmm. the Secretary had referred us to the court. And William Love had confessed. And he wrote it on after he sworn affidavit. We went back to court, and two of the judges says, eh, "William Love did not mm -hmm. admit that he was the person who fired the gun. So therefore, his sister is a witness to him firing the gun. It's irrelevant." And the other judge says, "Aye, as a matter of fact, William Love did admit to being the person who fired the gun. And it's there." <laughs> Uh, and therefore, his sister's evidence to uh, see him firing a gun is relevant. So therefore, I uphold the appeal. So two, he won. Now, it's not a question of opinion, uh, and it's not a question of law. It's a question of fact. You know, if it's a question of opinion, you can't do nothing about it. If it's a question of law, well, you can get a new appeal and re-argue the law. But they're, they're the experts in the law, so you must you must assume they're right. But if it's a question of fact, fact can be looked up. I was sitting with the paper right in front of me with William Love's confession, sworn, sworn affidavit. I was sitting looking through it when they're telling me it doesn't exist. Two day judges are saying William Love did not say. And I'm going, I'm reading it and saying, what, 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 what's this? What's this? So why would they not accept so it that? It took four years. Four years. I could have handed it over in four seconds. It took another four years for that court to get me back into court again. Four years to hand over that piece of paper. You know what I mean? And then you get out for the year, but then you get recalled. They, they brought you back again, did they know? Ah, well, they brought that, that, that two, two judges to one. One support, two against. One said that the paper did exist and the, the confession did exist and two said it didn't. Why did they need three judges for that? Well, it's three, three for a high court. Three, yeah, that forms... Forms a full, a full quorum. The court, mm -hmm. you know, it needs three judges for that. So you need two for the, yeah, for the approval to get. So, you so out. that that put me back in again. You were out for a year. Yeah. So you, see, when you were out for that year, did you think that was it done? I thought that was over. I just assumed that was over. And then you went back and done another six or seven years. No, no, four years it was. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Yeah, but another four years. It worked out at seventeen and a half. How many hunger strikes did you do? Well, I stopped doing hunger strikes. Uh, I, 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 I came yeah, uh, the horns of a, the horns of a, a dilemma. Uh, where I, well, what I did was try. I was turning it. What I was trying to do was get access to communications facilities because you can't get you can't. I mean, I was in solitary confinement in a, a, a stone box. And Peter Head, you, you ever seen the rock up on Tommy? No. Tommy doesn't know what day it is, doesn't mm -hmm. know what Jesus is or what praying is. He doesn't hear nothing, he doesn't see nothing, mm -hmm. he doesn't know nothing. You see a picture of Tommy with a box on his head, right? Tommy, that deaf, dumb and blind, blind kid who right. plays a mean mm -hmm. pinball. Mm -hmm. What do you call him? Elk John. Hi. That, that's rock up for Tommy. Right. That deaf, dumb and blind. Tommy's deaf, dumb and blind, right? Uh, 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 and they depict this by putting a, a stone box on his head, right? And that's for me, in solitary confinement. You're deaf, dumb and blind. How long you in it for? Uh, I, I don't know, about 10 years or something. Fuck maybe sake, Maybe Tommy. more, probably more. Uh, and that's just with a bed, nothing? Just with a bed, no, without, even without a bed, you don't even get a bed. The concrete floor? Could you get a, a rubber, a nice thick rubber mat. Uh, but, but what I'm saying is, all your letters are censored. You have no phone calls. Every letter in is censored. Every letter out is censored. Letters are stopped. Visitors? Letters are stopped. Do you get visitors? You get visitors once a month, maybe a half hour a month, an hour a month sometimes. Uh, but, 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 so your communications, if I'm suing the prison department, I'm, I'm, I'm suing the Secretary of State for Scotland. I'm suing the prison department. I'm suing the United Kingdom, Thomas Campbell versus the United Kingdom, European Court of Human Rights. And my letters to the European Court of Human Rights have been open, censored, and some of them stopped, not allowed, right? Letters from them have been open, censored, read, not allowed. Now, if I'm suing the government and the government is, is, is censoring all my mail, 
and from the soon the prison and the prison is censoring all my legal mail. The, the, you know, I've got, they've got a terrible, terrible advantage, and I'm at a terrible, terrible disadvantage. I've got to get out of that box to get private, confidential communications. So what I had to do was go on hunger strike to get to hospital, right, so that I could hand over documents, confidential documents, and receive confidential documents without the prison and without the government being aware of what I was doing legally. So you had to basically in, in my legal in my legal fights. So you had to basically try and kill yourself to just, pass all information. Yeah, for, to, to get some kind of freedom of communication. Speech. Yeah, freedom of communication. But 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 I was killing myself in the process of doing this. I was dying. I was killing myself. So so what I was what I did was I says I've not had a fair trial. I've not had a fair trial according to law. I've, I've done all, done all my research. Not had a fair trial according to law. So therefore I'm innocent and according to law. So therefore I demand the rights of an untried prisoner. I'll eat the food supplied by my family as per the rights of an untried prisoner, right? Which means that you need to keep me close to Glasgow so that my family can supply food. While I'm close to Glasgow, I can get unimpeded communication facilities, right? And you can't block me. You can't censor me. You can't stop me for, for conducting these cases against the prison department, against the Second State, against the United Kingdom, and against Her Majesty's Advocate. I was taking all these cases simultaneously. And, and and I couldn't cope with censorship, especially when there was no phones. And when they did allow phones, I was the one prisoner in the Scottish prison system that wasn't allowed to use a phone. One prisoner not allowed to use a phone. Uh, was there any times, Tommy, you felt like giving up? You felt like quitting? You felt like ending couldn't it? Feel, I couldn't have, couldn't have quit. So, 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 so what I was doing was I'm saying I'm no longer on hunger strike. I'm now under siege because it's now up to the governor to allow my family to bring up a box of compliance soup and give it to me. So I'm asking to eat, and the governor said, no, you're not getting it. So I'm asking to eat, and they're saying, no, you're not, you're, not, you're not allowed. So I'm no longer on hunger strike, I'm under siege. You know, uh, hungering for justice and a fight for freedom. That, that's the way I would put it. How, after you so you've done 17 and a half years, when you eventually, it came to an end, when you eventually got the not guilty, it's, it wasn't you. How was that day for you? Another day. Was that still when you must? Because it's hard to just accept it and try and go on with your life, especially when you nearly spent thirty years in the jail. I felt, I felt all through the time that I was out in bail, that was free, right? Uh, that it can't kind of lose, the case can't kind of lose because it's just and it's fair and it's true, you know. I, although some of it was like, there were still five miscarriages, the court upheld five miscarriages of justice. Only takes one miscarriage of justice to get you acquitted. But the court upheld five miscarriages of justice. And one of the miscarriages of justice, in fact, a few of them, but one of the miscarriages of justice harked back to the original appeal that I, I had to do myself because I was refused legal aid. So I had stood in the appeal myself and the, and when I got my reply from my appeal, the, the appeal court ridiculed me, right, for, for, for raising this particular point. Now, in the final judgment of the appeal court, the appeal court ridicules the court for ridiculing me and saying that I was right, that I was right, and the court was wrong for ridiculing me because I was right. You don't talk about. No, that was way back in '85. So if that court wouldn't have ridiculed me and gave me my just my just due at the time, I would have been free in 1985. A year later. Yeah, yeah, and that uh, an appeal court 20 years later makes a note of that. You know what I'm talking about? Did you ever get a an apology? Did you ever get a? But then there was uh, obviously a lot seems to have been swept under the carpet. Obviously, if you were a, you no, they pick an advocate, they pick a crown advocate to assess your case for you. So they pick your opposition. They, they pick the crown, the crown oh. was it prosecuting me, and they pick an officer of the crown to assess what damages I'm due. 
Uh, and he'll say things like, uh, but he would have went on to commit other crimes anyway. So therefore we'll deduct so, so much off he, w he would have got. How the fuck do they know? Can I, they say the future? Uh, hypothetical crimes. They deduct so much off of me for crimes that I might have committed had I not been in prison. That's what they've done to me. And you wonder why I was angry and wanted and had to come out here. He, you know what I'm talking about. And get away. Did you get compensation or anything? Did you get yeah. anything? Yeah. But obviously it doesn't... Oh, yeah, I bought the shoes. Uh, but it still doesn't replace the years. Like I say, life is, is, is priceless. When your mindset, like I say, we're going to the PTSD where the traumas of your life... When did you start getting affected with this? Like I say, the memory loss and yeah. there's so much pain you've been through. It's so frustrating. It's so frustrating. Uh, it's like somebody's took a shotgun and blew away part of your brain. Like, boom. Mm -hmm. It's just somebody took blow away part of your brain. It's so frustrating. The things that you used to be able to do, the things that you took for granted, the, the normal way of thought, the normal way of doing your normal business, it's gone. You try to do it and you run into memory blanks, you run into dead ends, you can't remember how to do this, you can't remember that, you can't do this. And you go, you, you want to cry. You, you really want to cry. There's a time where I have cried, right? Uh, I've, I've, I've been going round my office, I've got an office in the back. I've been around my office maybe looking for this particular document and maybe looking for that particular document. I've been working on it. This year, this is, I'm a wee bit better than that now. But I put it down, I put that down, and where is this, where is that? And then I realised that I'm spending so much time looking for things, memory dysfunction. I'm spending so much time searching for things, I'm spending half my life searching for things. All that wasted time again. You wasted time. You know what I mean? The time that you're free, but do you think you're that used to searching for answers yeah. and searching for stuff that yeah. it's just conditioned into you now? Yeah. yeah. And I found myself crying at the wasted time. Again, more wasted time. I, I, my brain is so damaged that, that I can't just function normally. I just can't, I can't just I, I go about my normal business and do things. Uh, everything is four or five times more difficult, more complicated for me. And that, that's what's frustrating you? Uh, yeah, it's frustrating. And, 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 and it was also, the frustration was also feeding the anger when I was angry. Uh, because I'd get angry with myself for being... For Frustrated. Being, for being such an idiot. For not being able to do this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. If you sit down and do a crossword, it would be easy for you. Sit down and do a sadduco. Mm -hmm. That'd be easy for you in the past. And how can you do that? You know, uh, look, look, I, I want to climb them. I want to scale the mountain. I know I can scale the mountain. I scale the mountain all the time. I, I, I'm, the peak of that mountain is my favourite spot. It's where I like to sit and, and, and behold the universe. Is that where you get your bliss, your freedom, and you feel yeah. alive? Yeah, and, and, and suddenly you find yourself in a wheelchair and you can't even go over the foothills. And you say, but I know I can climb that mountain. I've been there before. But you're not, you're in a wheelchair now. You've got to get it into your head. You can no longer get there. You're damaged. You know what I mean? You're physically damaged. You're, there's no recovery. This, this is what's so frustrating. You, you're never going to get it back. Is that where you feel anger and regret, that, that, especially the rage and the anger, because they've took away so much of your life? Yeah, you see what they've done to me. Mm -hmm. You're screaming in your brain, what have they done to me? You know, uh, as hard as it is, that anger and frustration, uh, listen, I've never done a fucking 17 and a half year sentence for something I've not done, but holding on to that anger and frustration, Tommy, is only going to make them win even more. It's trying yeah, to you know, kind of yeah. forgive and just kind of try and move on yeah, to, to accept that. Right. But it's such, it's such a difficult thing to do, especially that's what you went right. through. Did you do a lot of psychology stuff? Did you speak to a lot of any people to try and... No, to start with, no. I, I, I've, done, I've done a lot of practice in meditation myself. And at first I thought I could fix myself. <laughs> you know, physician, heal thyself. Uh, I thought I could do it uh, until uh, I went to the doctor for the... The doctor wanted to see me about why I couldn't 
remember to take my treatment and why I couldn't uh, uh, keep appointments. So he, he thought there was something wrong with my memory and he, he thought he would get that checked up to see if I was suffering from Alzheimer's or something. Uh, uh, it turned out, uh, he says, well, you're not suffering from, he got, got scans and things and he says, you're not suffering from any of that. But you seem to be suffering from some of your stress. I said, well, I've been told I've got a post-traumatic stress disorder. Is that, is that no stress? Some kind of stress, PTSD. I, why did you not tell us that? You just told us you were suffering from PTSD. I said, well, I forgot. Right? But short-term memory dysfunction is, is one of the systems of post-traumatic stress disorder. And that's why I couldn't remember my appointments. That's why I couldn't remember to take my headache pills and things like that. Uh, the dog does that. The dog tells me to take my treatment. Tells ah, you were saying cooks. that. It's amazing. Yeah. So the dog kind of looks after yeah. you and says when you cook your dinner, it lets you know yeah. when it's cooked. Yeah. Yeah. But like I say, you've been through the wars. You've been through what you've been through. is is, is yeah. barbaric kind of to, for people to, to get you to do that sentence. But why do you think they had it against you to like I say set it up or create alibis and create people to, for witnesses why would they for you it to get had, it was so it was such a sensational big big thing at the time I think the, the, some of the polls were quoted as saying they do, and the trials a matter of fact is if we don't get somebody for this we'll all be going about in woolly suits you talk about chief inspectors and things, uh, super, in, super superintendents. When they talk about we'll all be wearing woolly suits, it means we'll all be demoted. We'll be back to the black, with the black woolly suits. Uh, so instead of they all being promoted, they've all been demoted. demoted. Uh, so they had to get somebody, uh, and I'm the perfect target. Uh, me, they can say, Finished a 10 year sentence, gangster moved into the trade in the past two years. That's the kind of headlines they were before I was arrested, you know. So, for a jury to see that, they probably know who you are anyway. So, automatically, before the trial yeah. starts, they're thinking guilty. Yeah, they, they knew they knew that they could, they, they, they could present a picture to the press. Mostly, mainly, it was a kind of I mean, I had doctors in prison saying to me about drugs. Oh, you're the man. That's, oh, you're charged with a big drugs conspiracy. And I'm saying, no, you've got the wrong one there. Yeah, yeah, selling drugs on his team. And I go, what are you talking about? I, I, the first person I ever heard it from was from a doctor in Berlin prison. And it wasn't until after the trial there was this massive story about it about a drugs empire, a mad drugs empire. Yeah, Chinese they, whispers on it. Yeah, yeah, and it was, what was it, was it, was it, Emperor of Cantine. <laughs> <laughs> sitting in your, sitting in your consolidated <laughs> confinement with your fucking throne, your yeah. kings. Oh. I'm, I, I, <clears throat> and running, running his empire from his cell in Peterhead, I was in solitary confinement, I couldn't get a cigarette paper under my door, you know, everything was censored. I, mm. I was, protesting against the censorship mm. you know uh, um, even legal censorship I couldn't get a cigarette paper under my door and, and the press were saying I was running Glasgow's underworld from my cell in Peterhead you know what I mean but it's not just that uh, Tommy like I say was Big Ian was on my uh, Ian Blink was on my show a couple of weeks ago it doesn't just affect you the sentence it also affects your family like That's I say right. if you've got kids mother, father and also for the Doyle family, they've still not got a conviction. That's right. They're still no, they're still in pain, yeah. and they've still not got any closure. Yeah. Because even though you're going through your trial to get out, which was you're wrongly convicted, but that still digs everything up for them. So yeah, everything no. has that ripple effect. Yeah, no. How did your family and stuff? How were they dealing with it? How did they deal with it? Oh, shame, 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 shame. My 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 wife at the time was Liz. She became agoraphobic. She never left the house, and to this day. She still finds it difficult. Mm. She became that she couldn't couldn't leave the house. She couldn't show her face. Uh, uh, it's just a pure, pure horror. And it affects pure everybody. Horror. So yeah. that's what I'm saying for any young boys yeah. watching or listening. I, I know yeah. I look for the scheme boys, you know what it's like, Tommy. They all want yeah, to make a name for themselves. And it, 
you don't realise you, 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 it, it's all right uh, ha having fun and having a laugh, but you don't realise there's other people being dragged into things as well, you know. Uh, the, the, my, my family went through hell, you know. It was it was, it was a blooming shame, and so did Doyle family. You talk about a. Uh, and there's been no justice for the Doyle family. Well, at least one of them, one of them was murdered, another one dead. So there'll be no justice. Did you know the people who did it? Well, I know now who did it. Yeah. Which, like I say, if they're dead, then yeah, it's it's a bit of closure. But like I say, that pain and misery for yourself, for the Doyle family, for the people who are affected, even the people going. Even the people at the side are like the watching the case, mm -hmm. the juries that affects them as well because they would have mm -hmm. probably seen photos or they've seen everything. Like I say, everything has a ripple yeah. effect. Obviously, when you did get out, you try to clear the head, you've worked a lot in your mindset because you're a very intelligent man, Tommy. We spoke a lot the last couple of days and mm. the books you've read to rewire your brain, and you talk about all that to the conditioning, the unconditioning, and yeah. try and fix it. You wrote your second book as well. Mm. Um, it's a popular book yeah. uh, and now you're on the, 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 ver one. the verge of writing your third one yeah. for anybody watching where can they get your books where can they buy them where can they <coughs> get involved and the final judgement I think uh, Which, I, I think is is the best of the three the, the one that's presently underway and I don't even know where I'm going to publish it I'll probably take it back to Canongate. Uh, and I think, uh, I don't know, buy books where you buy books. Mm -hmm. Get them on the For yourself, think, yeah. check out his books and he's got the yeah. third book. If you need in hand, anybody, any publishers, anybody, because your story, I don't know why that's not been made into a film yet mm -hmm. or a documentary or because I know you like to keep in peace and heart. Yeah. You like away from all the bullshit and all the drama and you kind of just want to be like a yeah. ghost because you've been through that much. But, yeah. For you to come on the day, Tommy, and, and tell your story, it must be hard as well, because it digs up all the past as well, yeah. and it digs all the feelings and emotions back up. It doesn't matter if you've been through it all, and you try and rewire the brain. That can trigger things again. So for you to do that, mate, I appreciate that. Okay. And um, again, thanks for coming on. I wish you all the best for the future, Tommy. Okay. Good to speak to you. Uh, thanks Take a lot, mate. I appreciate on, that. Man. Cheers, brother. Thank hey. you. And I just want to say a massive thank you to Stephen McNeil at Permafix Roofing for sponsoring the TC Campbell interview. Permafix Roofing can repair or supply any type of flat roof at any size. You have various ways to contact Permafix Roofing. You can contact Stephen McNeil himself on Instagram at Stephen McNeil1 or Stephen McNeil on Facebook. Permafix Roofing also have their own website on Facebook. Collins Morgan have assisted thousands of Scottish residents with financial difficulty. So if you are struggling to keep up with the increase in cost living, along with managing debt, then message Collins Morgan on Facebook for free, friendly and regulated advice on the solutions available for you. AM Events are specialists in party wedding and event planning management. They offer services from full event planning and management right down to the standalone venue dressing. AM events strive for 100% customer satisfaction every time from email updates and how about the planning is going, managing the day of the event. They will support you the whole way through. So for more information, to make a booking, pop down to their showroom at Unit 2, Foundry Street, Atlas Industrial Estate in Glasgow. Their phone number is 0141 237 3020. So pop along or else their social media pages are on Facebook AM Events and also Instagram at amevents.glasgow.